Two stately stone lines watch over the entrance to the New York Public Library. Hewn from marble, they've stood there proudly since the library's dedication back in 1911. They were first nicknamed Leo Lennox and Leo Astor to honor the library's founders. But during the Great Depression, New York Mayor LaGuardia named them Fortitude and Patience, which were virtues that he thought New Yorkers should demonstrate in those challenging years of the Depression. The lines are still called Fortitude and Patience today. Last Sunday, I began a sermon series that I call the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. Jesus is referred to as the Lamb an overwhelming 28 times in Revelation. However, as we study our sermon text in Revelation chapter 5 today, we're going to learn that the Lamb is also a lion, a lion of fortitude and patience and strength. So please turn in your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 5, and follow along with me. We desire for people to respect Christ so much that they will obey and serve him. Last week we saw the slain lamb, the standing lamb, and the saving lamb. And today I want to draw out two more pictures of the Lamb in Revelation 5, which are significant in application to each of us. So this will be number four. The special Lamb. The special Lamb. Read with me now from Revelation 5, 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Of course, the occupant of the throne was God the Father. John saw a book in the palm of God's right hand, and John uses the Greek term biblion throughout this section of scripture. And it's from this Greek term that we obtain the word Bible. Biblios is also the opening Greek word of the New Testament found in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book, Biblios, of the generation of Jesus Christ. Now I do not believe that what is pictured here is a bound book such as we have today. That was unknown then. Their books were scrolls. Scrolls were long pieces of writing material from the papyrus plant. And this would be on rollers, and usually writing would just be on one side. The writing side was called the recto. And this is where the fibers were horizontal, and that made it easier for writing. The back side, or the verso, was used when there was too much material for one book, and hardly enough for two. And in that instance, writing was on both the front side and the back side. The prophet Ezekiel saw the same type of book early in his vision in Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10. He said, when I looked, I beheld and a hand was sent unto me and lo, a roll of a book was therein and he spread it before me and it was written within and without. And that's the way this was here. The book of, that John saw was written inside and out and it was sealed with seven seals. And sealing was used in ancient times to safeguard the material from being tampered with or being exposed to view and uh, to assume that it would get where it's supposed to be going uh, intact. It would be sealed like we would seal an envelope today. Their seal was usually of wax instead of glue and often there would be strings beneath the wax which would wrap the scroll and guarantee that it hadn't been opened or altered. Now in verse 2, 
And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Notice this was a strong angel that made this proclamation. And yet obviously this strong angel could not step forward to open the book and loose the seals. And he presents the question, who is worthy to do it? Now you can just imagine the keen interest of John who would be waiting to see who's going to step forward and uh, open the book. I was reminded of the fact that in the Marvel comics and movies, one of the most popular items is Molnor, which is Thor's mighty hammer. Said to be forged by dwarves in the heart of a dying star, the weapon is said to be so enchanted that it can only be lifted and welded by those who are worthy of its powers. And the most famous welder of that hammer other than Thor was Captain America who finally lifted the hammer against Thanos in the movie Avengers Endgame. Well, in John's vision, who would be worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? The challenge is made. Verse three, and no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look therein. The strong angel, he didn't step forward, nor did any of the cherubim, nor did any of the seraphim. No human on earth stepped forward. No one from under the earth, which might be an allusion to Sheol or Hades, where spirits are reserved under judgment. Nobody could break the seals. Nobody could open the book. Now look at the reaction of John. Verse 4, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And the imperfect tense of the verb suggests continued weeping until the worthy one was found. And we're going to see in just a minute, friends, that only deity could open the the book of Revelation. No creature in heaven or on earth or under the earth could be found who was able to do it. Now let me ask you a question as a, as a point of application. Since this is the case, does this not mean that all those today who without divine revelation and inspiration claim to look into the future and foretell what is yet to be are nothing more than deceivers? Yes or no? Friends, man cannot probe into the secret things of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. He can know the will and the plans of God only when those things are made known by divine revelation. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-11. Now, at this point in John's vision, the special lamb, now described as a reigning lion, is found worthy. Verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth only the special lamb was worthy why was he worthy well first of all the special lamb is worthy because he was slain as a sinless sacrifice 1 John 3 and verse 5, And we know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Second, the special lamb is worthy because he sacrificed himself. Ephesians 5 and 2, And walk in love as Christ also loved us, and have given himself 
for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Third, the special lamb is worthy because he was risen from the dead. We saw last week that the fact that the lamb was standing after it had been slain is suggestive of his resurrection and his ascension. The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57. Fourth, the special lamb is worthy because he partakes of the divine nature. The lamb is said to have seven horns and seven eyes. Well, horns throughout the Bible signify power and authority. The number seven suggests completion. So here is a portrait of his omnipotency. Then you've got seven eyes, and that would reflect his omniscience. And it's my judgment that the seven spirits of God are a reference to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would work in close association with the Lamb, both while on earth in his personal ministry, and then following the Lord's ascension, when he would take the place of the Lord, he would be sent forth to reveal, John 16, 13, to confirm Hebrews 2, 3, and 4, and to deliver the truth of the gospel, John 16 and 7. The work he did was the work of God. It was the work that Christ sent him to do. And then God's presence going out into all the earth portrays his omnipresence. And so we have here three of those omni attributes that belong exclusively to deity. And all of this shows us that only the special lamb, Jesus, was qualified to open the seven seals of the book. No one else had ever been sinless. No one had been so sacrificial. No one had been so victorious over death as was he. Heaven rejoiced. And when Jesus stepped forth to take the scroll, the Bible says a new song broke out and a myriad of angels worshiped Jesus around the throne of God. Notice verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. These seven traits listed may suggest the complete adoration that is due the victorious Son of God. He who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels now heard their tremendous worship of him. Verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So here's the praise of every created thing that exists in heaven and on earth and sea and under the earth of the Hadean realm of the glory of both Father and Son. And as they fall down to worship before the Lamb. Can there be any stronger statement of the deity of Jesus Christ? Emperor worship would be seen as false in light of a vision such as this. And many who today scoff at the scriptures and deride the Bible and defy the moral standards of God will at last admit they were wrong. Their life was wasted. They followed an illusion. They followed a fantasy all of their life. And when time shall be no more, their illusions will be taken away and they will acknowledge the lordship of the Lamb. Our English word worship simply means worth-ship. We worship that which is 
worthy. Revelation 5 shows us that the Lamb is worthy. The Lamb is worthy of our love, our praise, our devotion. He's worthy of every sacrifice that we make in, in time or in money. He's worthy of every form of service and every hour of service that we can give him. And so we definitely need this heavenly perspective on things. Brother Tilladest Headley was preaching in Belton, Texas, and he was finalizing his sermon one Sunday morning, going back over it. He was sitting on his front porch doing that, and his sermon was about the need for spiritual growth and worship. And at that time, Johnson's New Testament with notes published by the Gospel Advocate was very popular. I had one in my early days. And he opened that to the book of Revelation, and he read this passage here in Revelation chapter 5. And from that, he received the inspiration to compose one of his greatest hymns. Worthy art thou. And he wrote those words in pencil on the fly leaf of his Johnson's Notes, volume two. Lift up the voice in praise and devotion. Saints of all earth before him should bow. Angels in heaven worship him say, worthy art thou, worthy art thou. And Brother Tedley said this, he said, this is a powerful portrayal of what worship in heaven is like. How special it is to us, and oh, how much we should be interested in our worship here. Well, friends, for those who are bored by several hours of worship each week, well, they would be miserable, I guess, if they were suddenly gathered around the rainbow circle throne of him who was and is and is to come, and who is worshiped continually. But those who love the Lord fervently will find it to be a bliss far exceeding anything of this world. Here is the special lamb, for he is worthy. But now in the second place today, I want us to notice the strong lamb. The strong lamb. Earlier we saw that a strong angel could not open the book with the seven seals. Only the strong lamb could. Revelation 5 and verse 5, One of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. John turns to see a lion, but instead he sees a lamb. Jesus is the lamb lion. Lion's a powerful beast, easily capable of overpowering and destroying its enemies. Lamb is one concept, lion is another. And yet those two concepts together accurately portray our Lord to us. What threefold picture is given of him? Well, first of all, he's said to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now I'd like for you to turn back in your Bibles to Genesis, all the way back to Genesis 49, and look at a prophecy with me. In Genesis 49, verses nine and 10, because this reminds us of what Jacob said to his son Judah. In Genesis 49, 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up, he stooped down, he croucheth as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The regal authority of Christ is suggested in the term lion. The Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. This is a prophecy of Christ. You think about a lion being the king of the jungle. He's a symbol of great courage and strength. Those symbolize Christ. Furthermore, he's said to be the root of David. 
Isaiah predicted that in Isaiah 11 and verse 1. There shall grow forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the, the first verse of the New Testament refers to him as the son of David, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. He's the root of David. So he is king. He has dominion. He's king over his kingdom, Colossians 1, 12 through 13. And therefore men should give to him their very lives. Men should give to him glory and honor. The Lord ought to be obeyed. He ought to be respected and exalted, both in song and in life. And then third, he's said to be the one who prevailed. And that's an allusion to his overcoming death by the triumph of his resurrection. Prevailed, that's in the past tense. That tells us, friends, that Jesus has already won the victory. And what a thrilling declaration that must have been to those persecuted saints in the first century. Jesus had overcome. Jesus had prevailed. Jesus was worthy to open the book. And how thankful we ought to be that there was one who prevailed, who was worthy to open the book, who was the son of man, who was born of the tribe of Judah, of the seed of David, who prevailed over sin, Satan, in the grave, and who arose triumphantly. He's worthy. We normally don't associate a lamb with being a militant or a, a warring creature. You know, that's more known for innocence and, uh, and gentleness. So, so, so the picture of, of an angry uh, fighting lamb does not exactly make men shake in their boots, does it? But in this case, it definitely should. The people of God who are being persecuted for Jesus' sake ought to know that the lamb is strong like a lion. He's going to take care of his people eternally. He had seven horns, symbolic of perfect power. He is omnipotent. He can defend his people. He will take care of his enemies in his own way. He has seven eyes. He has complete vision. He knows the hurts. He knows the pains of his people. And we want people to know the lamb line that they might be saved eternally. All authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. Matthew 20 and 18 through 20. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I am come to sin Peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now we know Jesus did come to bring peace, Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. Does the Bible contradict itself? No. But he uses these paradoxical statements to help men understand the warring lamb, the lamb lion. Yes, Jesus came to bring peace in the sense of delivering people from sin and its consequences, but the Lord also came to bring war. Because since human beings are free moral agents and we have to make up our minds on whether or not we're going to submit to Christ, and since many reject the Lord in order for the Lord to accomplish his mission, there has to be that war going on between Christ and the devil, between truth and falsehood, between the army of Christ and the army of Satan. Jesus is the commander in chief of an army. That army is the church. And every member of the church of Christ is a soldier in the army of Christ. And as a soldier in the greatest army in the world, every Christian has to have a part in fighting the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6, 12, in warring a good warfare, 1 Timothy 1 and 18, and in suffering hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3. And recognizing the war weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, because we possess the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6 and verse 17. Teaching the truth brings one in confrontation with the forces of the devil. And that's why it is so important for us, friends, to see Jesus as the Lamb Lion, the strong Lamb, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and as such, he is, he's balanced perfectly. He never emphasized love to the exclusion of truth. 
and he never emphasized truth to the exclusion of love. With him, it was never truth without love, and it was never love without truth. He always spoke the truth in love. We have to do the same, Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love must grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And the lamb line revealed in the book of Revelation is not going to be pleased with any of us if we hold the truth but reject love, or if we try to hold the love while rejecting truth. We've got to preach the truth in love and contend earnestly for the faith. Because the Bible describes a living, powerful, lamb lion who gives us encouragement. And through his strength and through his cross, we can receive mercy and forgiveness so that we may live in joy. I want to conclude today with this story about a young lady who was in college. She taped a sign to the wall of her dorm room which said, Let God. And one day thinking that God was not involved in her life as he needed to be. She stormed out of her dorm room. She slammed the door. And when she did, one of the letters of her sign fell and altered the message to let go. Indeed, to let God help us, we must let go of our problems. With God in our lives, we need not worry, and that should move each of us to say the words of Revelation 5.13. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Will you obey the Lamb? By a penitent faith, your sins can be washed in his blood. The sermon is yours. Won't you come?